Hello, everybody. Welcome to our SummerSlam post show. I am John Pollock. Waiting is off tonight, but I have brought in the Top Guns to go through SummerSlam. Maybe the only two people I could convince to watch this lengthy, lengthy, lengthy show and then talk about it after the fact. Joining us tonight, the man you know as the king of all sport. He is brother Nate Milton. Nate, how are you tonight? What's going on, John Pollock? What's going on, everybody? It's been a crazy 48 hours in the world of wrestling. And, and this show, I, I assume, will be no different. You know, we, you, you told the people what was going to happen, John. You promoted the show. And at some point in this show, I'm going to sit down in the middle of this podcast and talk for 20 minutes about what's really going on with the way I felt about SummerSlam. The only thing, the only detriment to this show, John and Kate plus Nate, is I don't have ice cream for the people because a lot of my folks is lactose intolerant, but we do have butter cookies and Sunday school punch in the lobby for everybody after tonight. So uh, we, we have that to look forward to, Pollock. Well, Nate, you might need 20 minutes to get your message across, but like many of the matches tonight, we are drastically going to cut down your time uh, to, to keep things moving. <laughs> but also joining us tonight is a familiar voice here on the Post Wrestling Network. She is... Kate Hailing from Montreal. Hello, Kate. Hello, hello. Nice to uh, see here, all of you. I will try to not go on for 20 minutes and will try not to interrupt. I don't know what ice cream a few minutes tonight had me wishing that I bought vodka for everyone. But... Well, tonight's show, we will certainly be talking about the length of it. If you sat down at seven o'clock Eastern, Eastern, I think most people were looking at a, you know, a four hour, maybe a little over. We went way over. It was nearly five and a half hours at Allegiant Stadium tonight in Las Vegas. Manny Pacquiao be damned because their fight was just about to go into the ring uh, right as SummerSlam was concluding. So if you were someone that thought, man, I'm going to squeeze in SummerSlam, run down the strip and make it there for Manny Pacquiao, what could be his farewell fight? Sorry, you had to make decisions tonight. What would you have done, Nate? Here's the thing. What I would have done, John Pollock, if I'm in Vegas and I have the choice between going to see SummerSlam or going to see Pacquiao to Pac-Man, in what could be his final fight, John Pollock, I'm choosing option C, as if I'm Austin Aries seven years ago. I'm, <laughs> I'm hitting the strip and enjoying myself and, and, and allowing myself to have peace of mind where I don't have to worry about terrible booking decisions and perhaps seeing somebody's granddaddy get beat up in the middle of this ring. I, I definitely feel for that one person that maybe just had faith that this match was going to finish in time and just decided to stay for the end. The three count is made and they race for the doors. And then as they're getting out of Allegiant stadium, they hear the guitar riff for Brock Lesnar and are just furious as they're leaving. And they've got to miss uh, Brock Lesnar's big return. We are going to get to all of that, but we are not going to waste any time. Let us dive into the Chronicles of SummerSlam going back all the way to the kickoff panel. Not a whole lot to talk about. Uh, other than we looked at this card on paper and you know what I said, Kate, I said, this card, it needs more matches. It needs Big E and Baron <laughs> Corbin to wet our palate, to get us ready for the other 10 matches that had been announced for the main portion of the show. And that's essentially what the kickoff was. Uh, we got uh, Rain Cruz, who was the winner of the TikTok contest, who got to serve as the ring announcer here. I think very much channeling some Mike McGurk here. I thought I thought this Rain Cruz did like a fine job here. Easily, easily the best part of the pre-show for me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. This was a this was a high point of the sixty minutes before the four plus five plus hours. So, the story here is Baron Corbin has got his precious the Money in the Bank briefcase. There has been uh, no ruling by WWE. It's just this is just complete uh, lawlessness that's going on on the SmackDown side. And Biggie has to go out and fight this possession of his back into his his own possession. So, we had our. Standard match here where Corbin kicked out uh, of a or got out of a stretch muffler and hit a deep six. And he tried to run away with the briefcase and got shoulder tackled on the floor. Then Big E speared him off the apron. That got a pop from the crowd. Straps come down. Big ending. Big E wins in six minutes and 33 seconds. And he leaves with the briefcase. And that was that was our kickoff match. So Big E 
is now back in possession, Nate, of the briefcase. And honestly, John, this match went way too long for me, even if it was only six minutes. Like this should have this should have been what a match later on in this card should have been where Big E just ran through this dude. And also you 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 alluded to it, John. If I'm Big E, I'm not even signing up for this match, man, because like the you might have physical possession of the briefcase, but I won. Everybody saw me won. I could just send an email, a fax, because they probably still use faxes in, in, in Titan Towers. I could make a phone call, like I got Vince on speed dial. Like, I don't need this physical briefcase to play your little silly games here. So yeah, I don't even know why Biggie did it. He's a better man than me, John. Kate, did this uh, start the night off on a high note for you? Well, I mean, honestly, I would have been fine if they put this match on the main card, if it meant that we could have dropped a few of the matches that we did get. Well, more on that later. But I, what got to me that, you know, Biggie won the Money in the Bank match Corbin stole this from him, and now the powers that be are telling Biggie that he has to fight Corbin to get his uh, to get his prize back. So it's like, did WWE just like make a storyline out of institutionalized racism? Like, <laughs> the, it, it struck me as really weird. It's like they, that all of a sudden it's like, yeah, Corbin can just take this from you, and you have to fight him. Mm. Man, we were we were going for like a heavy hitting story right off the bat here. On I mean, the, the briefcase, to be fair, the briefcase is like manifest destiny, like it's built into money in the bank. Of course, so, you know, this is... I think what Biggie needs to do is that he needs much like uh, Drew had the, the replica sword. He needs a replica briefcase mm. now to throw off the scent now yeah. because we have a suit like. You're just going to hold on to this briefcase. You're going to like handcuff it to you, to your wrist for this whole time until you cash it in. This this contract seems like it's way more stress than it's worth. If you're going to play the long game here and hold on to this thing for nine months where you got to be looking over your shoulder, anyone can steal it. And then they have the contract. They have all the power that comes with it. He needs a J.J. Dillon or like a Mongo McMichael, somebody to carry around his Halliburton briefcase for him. Well, maybe, maybe more well, that we can. Also, I, I think that. Uh, Go ahead, Kate. Did we lose Kate? Oh, dear. We lost Kate like Biggie lost a briefcase. So <laughs> I, I hope that we are able to uh, uh, reconvene here. Did, did uh, the Wi-Fi, is she in Vegas? Did the Wi-Fi oh. cut out like it did at the stadium? Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I just got to, I'm not quite sure what going on there i've had issues before with the uh the internet connection when i've done this but seems to be okay now all right i can hear you again well let's move on to the main card because there's plenty of it um also worth noting logan paul was there right behind the announcers although did not get involved with anything tonight but that is being saved for monday when he will be part of moist tv more on john morrison and the miz to come mm. We opened up the main show with AJ Styles and Omos defending the Raw Tag Team Championship against Randy Orton and Riddle. And this this was kind of a theme of some of these early matches where it seemed that they were trying to get a lot in. Like Orton gets the hot tag and he's already going into like his big finishing sequences uh, like five minutes into this match. And it was a fine match. It was the crowd was into RK bro, we saw uh, Riddle send Omos. Uh, he gets knocked to the floor by Orton with a strike to the knee, and then Riddle drove him into the post. And from there, Styles hit a really nice backflip into an inverted DDT to Riddle on the floor. Orton uh, sidestepped the phenomenal forearm attempt and went for a pop up on AJ, stopped the RKO, and then we just got a schoolboy kick out. And then Orton on the second try hit the RKO, pinning AJ in seven minutes and five seconds. And we have new tag team champions, Kate. And do you think that this is um, at least kind of like a fresher start for this tag division and going this direction to take the belts off of Omos and, and AJ? I don't know who they're going to fight at this point. I mean, they, they, they okay, you've, you've got, Got the the tag titles on RK Pro, which is great. I think that's what people wanted, but what people expected. But now I don't know who you move on to. Um, trying to remember, I guess is it New Day? Are they still? I'm I'm so confused about which teams are on which show. But they're probably going to change things up a little bit anyway. But like I I don't know that you have a lot of heel tag teams for them to mm -hmm. to fight with. Are Otis and 
is, is, is he on no. Raw or is it no? It's like, okay, I'm really like like literally the only ones I can think of for New Day. So look, there, there are not a lot of teams, uh, period, regardless of heel, babyface designations. Yeah. Like yeah. there, this is the plight of the raw tag division. So either we're gonna get weeks of rematches, or they're gonna have to put some teams back together. Or turn the Viking Raiders. It's it's very slim pickings. Like well, on Raw, you're right. Yeah. You bring up a great point. Like it's New Day, Viking Raiders, and now the, the this set of babyface champions. Like you're only looking at AJ and Omos, unless um, I guess T Bar and Mace. Maybe it's time for them to get the big. Uh, they get to get the call up now too. They can rise them. to the rise to the top. Get that. Yeah. Get I'm that sure. push that we all thought they deserved. Uh, Nate, uh, what did you think just in terms of a, an opener and, you know, getting seven minutes here? I mean, this kind of yeah. set the table for the early portion of the show of, I thought, trying to cram a lot into uh, a small amount of time for some of these matches. I thought it was a decent opener. It was, uh, you know, it wasn't Midnight versus Rock and Roll Express. You know, it wasn't anything to that <laughs> level, uh, but it, it was a good match. It was a good opener, as Kate mentioned. Like, the crowd is really into RK Bro. Like, I can... I can take them or leave them, but people are into that team. And so I, th- I thought it was a good move. Like the only problem is like, who do they feud with? Because I'm not, I'm not here for another Miz and Morrison feud. I'm not here for, you know, another round of rematches with AJ and almost, which it feels like that's what we're going to get. John is months of this. Like I, I, maybe it's just cause I had a birthday and like, I'm, I'm older now, but it's like back in my day, John Pollock, when the champs lost, that was the end of the feud, not the beginning of the feud. And it feels like this is just the beginning of AJ and almost versus RK bro. So, yeah. And you do bring up Miz and Morrison, which is probably as, as viable an option as you have on, on the heel side. So there, there is that too. Eva Marie against Alexa bliss, uh, this w- this did not turn out to be some you know produced um, uh, cinematic match for lack of a better term. Which you know if you look at this this I guess had that possibility. Instead, they just did at best you can be charitable and call this a raw TV match. Uh, it went three minutes and fifty seconds. Alexa came out with Lily, and I was stunned because there were fans that were holding up these dolls. I would, I would love to know what these dolls set people back. I'm guessing minimum 35 bucks for these dolls. Uh, Eva knocks down Bliss and then takes Lily, yes, the doll, and starts slapping the doll around and then attacks Alexa with Lily. This serves as Alexa's urn because she comes to life, at, not Lily, Alexa, and fights back. She misses a twisted bliss, but then hits a DDT, pinning Eva Marie, and then Dewdrop laughs over Eva Marie's loss and announces her as the loser before she puts on Eva Marie's robe. I felt like we just skipped by like two months worth of story here to just the breakup here between these two. Uh, I have I have nothing to say about this match other than. I wouldn't have enjoyed it on Raw, but it had more of a place on Raw, Nate, than I feel it did on this pay-per-view. Yeah, like I'm not thrilled with the story they've been telling with Alexa and Eva Marie thus far. But if you're going to book a match with the creepy, spooky lady, let her do creepy, spooky lady things. And they didn't. This was just a regular match. And, you know, it it fits into a theme. And, I, you know, Kate can speak to it maybe even more than I can. But, like, with all the talent they have, in this company in terms of their women, they don't know how to tell a story with these ladies, man. Cause like this match didn't have a story. I think that people were into, we'll, we'll talk about it later with what goes on with the SmackDown women's title. And then with the raw women's title, it's like, you're giving me matches, but there's nothing to hook, hook onto and sink my teeth into in terms of a story here. A hundred percent. I don't think that there was anything really to enjoy here um i don't uh i didn't get into the the other women's matches for for various reasons and i know I, I complain a lot about AEW and how they handle the women's division but at the same time it, it, it's one thing to give women t- time but if you're just giving them this sort of crap to do then who cares well um if you were left with this match and saying man the women really got shorted on time <laughs> Boy, were they about to go all in on that argument. So, uh, Mario Lopez, AC Slater's backstage, yes. 
And this seemed to just be like some integration that they had with, with Tiffany Haddish and Mario Lopez just to get some celebrities on here. Uh, Tiffany Haddish was doing their after party as well. So they had that uh, tie in for SummerSlam um, just to have Mario Lopez hang out with RK bro. And Riddle's going to have a surprise for Randy Orton on Raw tomorrow night. I cannot wait. Sheamus versus Damian Priest for the United States Championship. This was uh, the first match that got uh, some significant time. They went 13 minutes and 47 seconds. Uh, the early portion was Sheamus working over the back of Damian Priest, and they tried to get it across like this. He had a really rough landing on this dive to the floor, so the back injury did work for the beginning. And then Priest, they worked into some near falls, and they – Turn this into, I, I thought, like a pretty enjoyable match. They were starting to trade near falls. Sheamus kicked out of the south of heaven and then used a heel hook. And Priest fired up, tore off the face mask of Sheamus, dropped him on the turnbuckle, spinning heel kick, and the reckoning for the win. And Damian Priest is your new United States champion, Kate. About what I expected. Uh, I, I figured he'd win. I, I... I was a little underwhelmed by this match because I, I guess I think Sheamus has had a bunch of pretty solid matches on TV, but, uh, and I'm trying to think on, on paper. Anyway, he's had some solid matches this year. Mm. I guess my expectations were a little higher for this one. Yeah. I look at the show like this on its own. I wouldn't say this was like all that great of a standout. And maybe this is just more so my impression of the show at the end. Like I thought this was like on the upper echelon by the end of the show. <laughs> yeah, and this, and this no, was it's, like, it's, it was, it's... you know, it was a fine match that you would see on raw. Um, I, I don't have too many mm-hmm. complaints about it, but I mean, that does go to show. I think the, the overall quality of this show, I thought there were a lot of underwhelming matches on this show. Yeah. And, and you could make the argument, you know, Kate said Seamus has been pretty solid. Like I'd go even further. I'd say that during kind of the pandemic era, particularly last year, like Seamus put on some really good matches and he's somebody who I think probably deserves a little bit better in this current company, but the match itself, it, it was okay. It was okay. It, it, the one thing I thought about during this match, and maybe this goes to where my headspace was at at this point in the pay-per-view, John Pollock, Chris and I were talking like we have a, NWA podcast group chat on, on on Twitter. And I was like, legitimate question, guys. Is Damien Priest like darker or is it just the contrast in ring with Sheamus? Because I couldn't tell. I thought the brother was, you know, working on his tan or something because his colors was popping tonight, John. And I don't know if it's just because the contrast with Sheamus just made him stand out a little bit more. It could have been that. I mean, he's he's been in Vegas for at least yes. uh, 24 hours. I mean, it's very, very hot outside. If he was working on his tan uh, as well, that, that could have uh, played a factor in all of this. Uh, but later he said that winning this United States title is proof that the American dream is alive. <laughs> so he did it. He won the United States championship. The Mysterios are preparing backstage. Dominic apologized for his actions on SmackDown. Ray said, who cares? Just SmackDown. No one was paying attention last night anyway. That's the Mysterio way. We never quit. So I didn't think things were going to go very well. This was the 16th anniversary of Ray putting Dominic and his custody on the line against Eddie Guerrero. August 21st of 2005. Here we are, full circle. And they were challenging the Usos for the SmackDown tag titles uh dominic early on doing the eddie spots going for the three amigos and then climbed to the top and he was shoved to the floor by jay so they had the heat on dominic for quite a time until making the hot tag to father ray ray went for a reverse cross body off the middle rope and got nailed with a super kick kicked out of an uso splash and then ray fights back he hits a 619 the crowd gets into that as they always do and goes for the frog splash he lands on jimmy's knees And Dominic is not in the corner because he was getting involved and got knocked out to the floor. So Ray has to fight for himself. The Usos double team him with super kicks. Another Uso splash to the back. And Ray eats the fall in 10 minutes and 50 seconds. Dominic Dominic is consoling dad, which was nice that you were there for him after the match because you weren't there for him when it counted and he needed to make the hot tag. So father and son, the dissension continues. At this point, John, like, even Marie match aside, it's not a bad show at this point. 
like mm. you know this this match you, you know what this felt like like this was a fine edition of smackdown yes I've seen this match a hundred times exactly These match, like exactly it, it, like there was nothing above and beyond to me uh, at yes. this point of the show i could see that identical damian priest sheamus match and i probably have on raw many many times and i've seen every incarnation of the mysterios and usos on fridays for the last two months as well so <laughs> that's what this show felt like to me and the length of the matches was also around the same time you would expect on TV too. So like this wasn't feeling like a big pay-per-view to me um, this, this deep into the show. No, but I, I wasn't at the point where I was throwing things at the screen yet. Like at this point, I'm like, okay, th- they've got room to go from here. And <laughs> that they did. <laughs> Boy, did they go, Kate. <laughs> Maintaining hope. Well, the, okay, here's the thing. And, and I, I agree with everything you're saying. This was fine. The matches they've had on TV have been fine. Yeah, yeah. My issue with them pushing Dominic Mysterio so heavily is that he is 24 years old. He has grown up his whole life around the sport. If anyone has had advantages in terms of being able to get access to the best kind of training, the best advice, uh, if anyone has uh, sort of privileges that other people don't within the industry, it's him. So he's the same age as MJF. He's the same age as Jungle Boy. He's the same, like, he's the same age. As, again, like, you're talking about a lot of these young stars. He's the same age as, like, a Wheeler Yuta. So to me, if he's not, I'm not saying that, you know, obviously a certain amount of talent is just inborn. It's natural. So not everyone can be top of the card. But if he isn't at least in the conversation as being as good as those guys or on their level, then I question why they're pushing him to this extent on the on the card because it just becomes yeah it's his name but like i don't know that he has warranted the kind of push they've given him yeah it's it's i think fair when when we compare like where you know especially for wwe that has invested so much in the last decade of their whole development program like they have built a mm-hmm. performance center that opened in 2013 like we're talking eight years now. And yes, they have, they've been able to bring up a lot of talent, but a lot of that talent has been cultivated outside of there. And in terms of like a project from start to finish, like Dominic has, I mean, he's had his training. He has trained with Lance. He's trained with others, uh, but he's now been on the roster for a year. And I think those are completely fair comparisons when you're looking at um, people of the same. And I think it also underscores just the, how few, um, you know, mid to early twenties performers we have on the WWE main roster. Like this is a much older roster. I was trying to think of, I was trying to think of someone within WWE who I could use. I didn't want to make it seem like I was just using, uh, and it's not just AEW talent. Like Chris Bay on impact is the Sid is around the same age. He's like 25, 26. Like again, if, if he's not at their level, if he's not being spoken of in the same terms that they are, then he's, then he doesn't justify being placed this high on the, on the card. I, I would be very curious if someone wants to like, look this up on the main roster outside of Dominic, who's the youngest male on tonight's show. I think it's a pretty high number. Like Omos, ma- maybe Omos. <laughs> like it's a, it's a lot of like 35 and over yep. uh, performers that we're looking at. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, Omos is probably the next, uh, the next youngest performer that, that we're looking at here. Like even Riddle, who has like a very youthful look, is probably a lot older when than people think. Like he is, I want to say 35. Mm. So in that mm-hmm, neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think mid-30s. Same with Rollins. Then we have uh we go backstage and this is where Damian Priest is interviewed. He compares winning the US title to winning a gold medal at the Olympics, and it's proof that this is the land of opportunity. Rick Boogs is inside the ring and he plays King Nakamura. I was like, are we actually adding a match? The answer was no. This was just to get Nakamura's entrance on the show to do his act with Pat McAfee. So whether you like this or not, they clearly love this act. The fact that we had to shoehorn this onto the show for absolutely no reason. There was no angle for this. It was if we just want Nakamura's entrance to be represented on this show that is already stacked with matches and segments. Yeah. I, I, look, that, that that is a true, that is a fact, John Pollock, but I loved it, man. Like I thought it was, you know, if we're looking, comparing this to other segments that weren't revolving around matches on this show, this was the best of them. Because, like, I, I think 
It got the audience engaged. And yeah, like Pat McAfee starting to starting to grow on me, John. At, at first, I was a little bit skeptical, but like stuff like this, I, I enjoyed it. So dude, there was this- nobody that had a greater time tonight than Pat McAfee watching this show. I mean, this is as close as you could get to just miking up a fan at ringside. This guy brings such an energy, whether you like him or not. His energy is just I mean, it totally fits the vibe of what you want to <laughs> convey. Out comes it is infectious. Yeah. It, it is. It is like it's, and I think they they love like the energy that that he brings and has brings out a lot in Michael Cole as well. Yes, we get an entire video package for the WrestleMania main event rematch: <laughs> Bianca Belair, Sasha Banks. Someone spent a lot of time on this video package. God bless this person. Out comes Bianca Belair first, and then in the ring. As you are just seconds away from the match that closed night one of WrestleMania, the match everyone was buzzing about after both nights of WrestleMania, Greg Hamilton announces Sasha Banks can't compete tonight. Instead, Carmella is going to face Bianca Belair. This crowd was pissed, and I do not blame them. And let's start off there before we get into everything else, okay? Sasha Banks missed both live events last week. She was off SmackDown. They knew she was not going to be competing tonight. And I think it was a big mistake to just play as if this match was going to be happening literally until the last second. And I think this could have been handled in a much better way of just explaining, even on 24 hours notice, there are circumstances. Sasha Banks will not be available. However, we have secured an opponent for Bianca Belair that she has never faced before. And it's, to me, it's pointing everyone in the direction. Everyone is going to want Becky and you have 24 hours of buzz for it. And instead they did this, and this is not even getting to the match portion, but Kate, what did you think of just how they handled this of what was hardly a throwaway match on the show? I would imagine there were plenty of people. This was the most anticipated match for them. For me, it was... This it was between this and Rollins and Edge. Those were the two matches that I was thinking, okay, whatever else happens in the card, I think these are the ones that are going to pull it out. So yeah, when you start hearing like, I, it started to to seem like a joke at some point because you, you keep hearing now. Look, I'm I'm more on Twitter. I'm I'm hearing more news about what what's going on than than the average person. So to me, it just started seeming stupid. That you're hearing that Sasha's not there, that she's not. But people may have been aware, like they may have been aware that she had missed shows. They were certainly would have been aware that she wasn't on SmackDown. So at some point, you know, you had, they basically every single thing that they did with this, I would have done differently. Like, and I guess, you know, thank thank God there wasn't an example in the wrestling world of uh, audience anticipation being managed really well that we could use as a a comparison to what they did (laughs) that would make them look worse. Um, I cannot imagine the thought process and i i've tried to i'm like okay if they were if they were really in a, if they're really stuck if if they're really in a bad position but they were stuck days ago they had mm-hmm. days to work around this and they did uh, i think they they could have introduced this really sort of juicy match we'll get to it in a second but uh, they, they have the ability to, to to build anticipation with that and like you said they don't even have to say who it is as soon as the announcer said Sasha wasn't cleared you heard people chanting for Becky like it, everyone would have known they would have been it would have been very clear where uh, where this was headed there was no reason I felt kind of sorry for Carmella in this because just to, to bring her out she, she was literally put into the role on by of, the crowd yeah she was put in a terrible position to be out there as yeah. the uh, oh my god you can't possibly be using her <laughs> as the replacement I mean Nate yeah. on top of the, it oh, the one she's beat three times exactly <laughs> and did the night before uh, Nate on top of it it's like you are taking like you are announcing this to people in the moment. And like as big as Becky coming back is it's offset by like, you're not even cushioning the blow of you're losing out on the Sasha match that I would have at least done that at minimum the night before. So at least you have a day that people are accept. Okay. 
There's circumstances beyond their control. The match is off. And again, you tease it. And there's, to me, if you're teasing a mystery opponent, you do that when you have a big person to deliver. And I don't think there's anyone bigger they could deliver realistically than Becky Lynch. And you have that card to play. So let the speculation run rampant. And then you're delivering on it tonight. And I just think that would have been just just playing to both. It's like you have a pretty understanding audience if they explain she's not cleared and we have an opponent and just wink, wink, drop a hint and just lead people in that direction and then pay it off. It was that's definitely the way I would have gone about this. As, as a fan of Sasha, too, I was uncomfortable because now I'm left wondering, like, is she OK? What not cleared how? Like, yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the mind goes to COVID. We're in the middle of the pandemic, but we don't know that. And so now I'm like, well, th- is she injured? Is this a long term thing? It's like it seemed to come up kind of abruptly. Like, it's you know, give give her fans something too. Like, acknowledge yeah. that this is the real world. Injuries happen. Sickness happens. You can work with it. And the fact that not only did they promoted in the pre-show john but we just did this damn video package when you know this woman isn't coming out man i felt like that was just disrespectful to your audience because like you said the audience is forgiving they'll go along with a lot they'll put up with a lot from these wrestling companies but i thought that was just it it put your performers in a bad spot and the spot would get even worse in a few minutes and it it didn't like it it was just You've got all of these talented performers, and this is the way you choose to put these pieces together, to put these stories together. Like, it just, it set the tone, John, for what was going to be a very, a very yeah. dark period of this pay-per-view, man. Yeah, it's and, just and, stuff and, I yeah, just... Nate, I think that you and I probably, I was just going to say, like, I think that you and I may be on the same page. I, for me, the, the, the show started, went off the rails at this point, and yeah. Like well, it, I, I think this uh, one, it was, this I was, was ha- something, I had a lot of frustrations from this point on. So Carmela's out there and yeah, she's just in this terrible position where she's like the, the worst case scenario. That's what she's being presented as mm-hmm. to this crowd that just, it's not even heat for Carmela. It's, 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 it's heat for the company that you're taking this match and this is what you're giving us in return. So Bel Air announces that sooner or later I will get Sasha in this ring and they're getting ready to start the match when Becky Lynch's music hits. And the place is just a thunderous roar for Becky. It's her first appearance since May of last year. She comes out, she takes out Carmella, tosses her into the steps and then has the face off with Bianca Belair, makes the challenge and Bel Air accepts. And I think at this point, it's like the audience is, I think they're still in surprise like they're still reacting like we lost the sasha match but this is pretty cool we're getting becky's return so i think it's like (laughs) you've gone in two extremes and i think it's almost a push at this point um but it would not be a push for bianca belair as we would see moments later because the match is accepted becky puts out her hand for a handshake the code of honor is not followed through as Becky sucker punches Bianca and hits the manhandle slam and pins Bianca in 26 seconds to win the SmackDown women's title. This place was like, it was the pop you get for any, it's a title change, but man, this crowd, it's like you, (laughs) you took away the big match with Sasha and in a weird way, you dangled a very intriguing match and almost took that away from us Mm -hmm. as well. So it's like you screwed us twice in the span of five minutes. And what's the state of your women's division after this? You have Becky, who is now the champion, who I think a lot of people will question, is she really ring ready coming back? Or was this just done to protect her? But we'll see. That's one thing. She just beat Bianca in 26 seconds. So Bianca does not look like a credible threat. Maybe you can say like, oh, will you surprise me? Uh, Carmella looks like a complete fool. Hmm. Zelina Vega, 0-4, coming back. Uh, Tony Storm made one appearance, hasn't shown up. Mia Yim has like, is in theory on the roster. Natalia 
and Tamina are doing the the tag thing. Uh, Shotzi Blackheart, Tegan Knox doing the tag thing. Like who who do you have for Becky to fight with? Especially if there's gonna if especially if there's an issue with Sasha. Yeah, like Nate, I imagine they just they run this back and and again to Kate's point, like maybe it was a case where they had to find something someone to replace Sasha and Becky. You know, maybe to me, it's like I I can't imagine it's such a case where you couldn't do a semblance of a match. And I I just think given the fact that people were like you would have earmarked. Um, you know, a significant amount of time for Bel Air and Banks that you you had to at least give people a match uh, beyond this. I just thought that Becky's return, like this has been a year and a half, and I just think they really um, um, trivialized it because coming out of this, it was to me just looking at like we didn't really get a match. It was sort of this bait and switch with Sasha Banks all week. And on top of it, like we didn't even get a match in its place. And I think it like took off some of the steam of Becky's return. I just didn't think it did. Well, she did looks like an asshole. She, she, she kind of got like, positioned like that. Okay. Like she suckered Bel yeah, Air here with this the, false she's handshake. Heel. <laughs> yeah. It's like people, people will cheer her, but she's clearly the jerk in this, uh, in, in this equation. Bianca got really screwed over. Like, I guess like, instead of all of the, like, I was looking at that and it's like, oh, they turned Bianca into the female Kofi. Like that's exactly, it's like mm. just sort of have her get beaten in like a few seconds and like, okay, we're done with that. <laughs> what, what could Bianca and Kofi have in common, John Pollock? <laughs> I don't know, man. Look, well, this, you, you look at it as well and I'll throw like Daniel Bryan into the mix. And I know that mm-hmm. people are going to compare this to Daniel Bryan. It's like, guys, in 2012, that, that layout, that was not designed to get Daniel Bryan nope. over, okay? That was 100% for Sheamus. <laughs> and it was a complete... And when they the audience got behind Bryan beginning the next night, uh, dude, it was two years before they really went with Bryan and their backs were against the wall. So, like, I, I don't look at that either as this, I, this, this crafty idea that this is going to help Bianca if you want to make that argument. I think Bianca is one of the few performers that they have done a really great job with this year. And I would say this is the most significant misfire with Bianca tonight, regardless of whether they go back to this match next month. And I think by necessity, they have to, I think you have to do the proper match, but I just look at this entire promotion and I just, if you could go back a week, I'm doing a a significant redo of this to the point that maybe you just say, if, if we can't do a full match and 26 seconds is our option, Maybe we just come clean and say, hey, this match can't happen. And you save Becky's return for when you're ready to do it. I just, this to me did not, it did not work. And it just took a lot of air out of the sails of Becky's return. And there's not a whole lot of returns you get to do. Like you only get to do this first impression, this return once. Yeah. And only it just get to give it like, away once. It's like, yeah. They, they wanted their CM Punk moment and they tried twice. One moment was more successful than the other in terms of this this right here john like it feels like they were too clever by half because it's like you didn't even have to do this match you could have had bianca roll through carmella then becky comes out and we set this up and we actually build to something because because it works we saw last night john if you tell people something is coming even if you just hint at things people will turn up and so like i and and i john and maybe this is something that, that you're not saying, but I've seen it already tonight. People are like, just wait until the story. Let, let them tell the story. Like, they're, they're obviously going somewhere with Bianca. Like, come on, man. I'm a grown-ass man, John Pollock. No. I've been watching wrestling since 1986, <laughs> man. And, and I've been watching the WWE since, since that time, man. When people tell you who they are, believe them, right? Like, I had the same conversation with people when Kofi got squashed by Brock. It's like, oh, this is going to lead to Kofi coming back with it, with more intensity. And this is going to lead to, you know, <laughs> never was right. And it, it didn't and like you can say Bianca's at a different point in her career than Kofi and they have more invested in Bianca. But I'd be a fool, John Pollock, to put my faith and my trust in this creative team that has told me so many times that a we don't know how to really book women. B, we really certainly don't know how to book black women. And C, like, we're trying to do anything right now, throwing stuff at the wall to see if it sticks to keep up with, with this, this, this other company that we say isn't competition, man. Like, and then I think, like, everything, like, this whole next five minutes just 
really got, and you could tell, John, by my voice, like really got me annoyed because not only did we take Bianca Belair, who had this historic matchup with Sasha Banks, we, you know, we sent these girls to the ESPYs and promoted like this was a big deal. And this was a big moment. These two black women breaking through. And then we did this to her. And then I and guess, as a, I guess as a make good, we brought out the two black Olympians because, hey, we like black people. It's like, come on, Vince. I'm I'm not buying it, man. I'm not buying. But that makes it more obvious. That makes the that makes the the problems more obvious, not less. It's like, oh look, we're mar- like we're bringing out the black people. So like, we know we really, it's no, we don't really have problems with with uh, black performers. I completely agree with you. I just I, I I was deeply deeply uncomfortable. And this like to have Becky just walk out having not been in a ring mm-hmm. for a year and a half and squash your champion, how that diminishes that wonderful match at mm-hmm. WrestleMania that that Bianca and Sasha had. It, it, it tears away at that moment. It's, it leaves a stain on it. And, and that annoys me because I thought that the, the WrestleMania match was uh, one of my favorite WWE moments the entire year. Mm-hmm. And I don't... I don't get where they're going with this, but I don't think they do either. I think no. that they're just going for the pop in the moment. And, and they, they don't, this diminished uh, Becky, I don't like, trust them to fix this. Absolutely. I like Becky, but Be- like Becky doesn't come out of this any better in my eyes because of this nope. match. Like this is something you, you really should have built and, and made this a special event, much like Sasha and Bianca. But no, we got this because we want to get people talking because we're tired of hearing them talk about that guy in Chicago for the last 16 hours. So this is this is when on Friday Bianca comes out and says, I don't know if everyone forgot, but two weeks ago, we I have a legally binding contract that says Sasha Banks on this contract. I don't think it says the man because that title is coming back to me. And they do the impossible and turn Bianca Belair, maybe the most uh the most relatable baby face they've had in the last five years, and they turn her. Yep. How how do you screw this up, man? Like Bianca, Becky, open goal. So many great performers in this women's division, and you screw it up, man. And it's not their fault. It's not Becky's fault. It's not Bianca's fault. It's whoever's writing the damn story. Let's let's keep going because uh, we are getting late, and I do want to get to uh, to phone calls, and we are only midway through the show here. So this, to say the least, there were a lot of upset people about the handling of all of this, which I would not have predicted for if you had told me Becky Lynch's return. Mm-hmm. Dot dot dot. So then we got a promo running WWE Crown Jewel coming in October. That's a that's a whole perfect. side because issue. We're not we're not going to dive into for right tonight. after the, uh, yes. the women's match. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Greg Hamilton then interview uh, brought out our Olympic gold medalist uh, hmm. Tamira Mensa Stock and Gable Stevenson. Uh, Gable Stevenson, who has been everywhere, he was on the Bellator broadcast. Dude, he was in South Dakota on Friday. <laughs> He's here at WrestleMania or at SummerSlam tonight, and uh, this guy is just uh, going everywhere. Extreme Rules will be next uh, September, September twenty sixth, back on a Sunday night. Jinder Mahal versus Drew McIntyre uh, went longer than I thought it was going to be. That Still was not lengthy, but this one I was not complaining about. Four minutes and 38 seconds. Nothing offensive. Jinder just got tossed around by Drew. He pleaded with Drew. We used to be like brothers. Then you started texting me. And Mahal nailed him with a super kick. McIntyre comes back with a bunch of belly to bellies. Future shot, countdown, Claymore. Wins the match, 438. And then he chases off Veer and Shanky, who are allowed to come down to ringside after the match. Uh, with the sword, but there was no stabbings here. Um, I, I had, I really had no issue on a show this long. This is all this match needed to be. Full disclosure, John, after the last segment, like I was literally checked out for the next 45 minutes to an hour on this show. Like, and I, and I came into the night, John, actually looking forward to it, man. I was looking forward to SummerSlam, looking forward to talking about it with you and Kate. And they killed my enthusiasm in 26 seconds. So I, I don't give a damn about what happened with gender, man. <laughs> are, you, are you saying the booking hindered gender? It hindered gender and it hindered my enjoyment of this whole show. <laughs> Kate, anything to add on, on this match or do we just move this, on? This match had no business being on the show. The one thing that occurred to me uh, was that a couple of years ago, Drew had to take the match after Kofi beat Daniel Bryan at WrestleMania. 
And tonight he had to follow that thing with Becky. I think someone just freaking hates him in terms of the, uh, in terms of where they book him on these big shows. He's an interesting one to watch these next few months. I mean, they've done the step where he can't challenge Lashley and he just mm-hmm. seems like, I, I just see a lot in this guy. And I think he's one of the guy that they really did a great job with this last year and a half. And he's just, he's in a position now though, where I think it's like, he's just kind of floating in place and and I hope he doesn't just slip through the cracks and becomes this mid tier player. And whether that's moving him to SmackDown or doing something else with him, like I, I'm interested of what the next oh, program is with him. I, I think he will. I did, to me, I know they seem to book him super strong for the last year, but to me, it always felt like they viewed him as a transitional champion until like between Lesnar's contract running out and crowds coming back because they like they dropped him the second that audiences were back and it's yeah he like he had a good long run but i don't know how much i don't know i just i i never felt like they they were really as invested in him and when you look at how they how they positioned him when they first called him up to the main roster when he was part of that little trio with corbin and lashley and sometimes ron stroman um i don't know i, I i've never gotten the feeling that they see him as a top tier guy other than to be sort of the top tier loser nikki ash versus charlotte flair and rhea ripley for the raw women's championship um this was a another one they they got 13 minutes here and a lot of it was just you know coming up with different three-way spots uh taking one individual out while the other two would work and kind of nikki in the underdog role who would come up with various counters um Charlotte, to me, was kind of the standout in this match. Uh, this match was not without its flaws. There was, was some sloppiness at, at different points. Uh, one of the big moments was Flair doing a corkscrew moonsault to both women on the floor. And it looked like Nikki's head just got knocked into the barricade after the move. Uh, Ripley then applied her inverted cloverleaf on Nikki. Flair went to break it up with a boot that totally missed. And then Ripley applied the inverted cloverleaf to Flair. That was broken. Uh, We get a figure eight that Nikki breaks up and then Nikki counters the riptide with a DDT, misses a high cross to Charlotte. And with Ripley selling on the floor, Flair puts on the figure eight. And the way the camera was, you could see Ripley's hand on the edge of the apron like she was just peering over. And I'm assuming, okay, she's going to make the save. But then Nikki just tapped. So Ripley just kind of was there watching this. (laughs) And Flair, Charlotte Flair wins the Raw Women's Championship. and. I don't know about you two where you think the Nikki Ash character is going, but this sort of felt to me like we did our one month run with this character and now she's going to settle into like a middle of the pack kind of role. And we're going to move forward with Charlotte as one of our a players like this kind of seemed to me. Well, like they, the they've heard the, they've heard the reactions that we all have. I mean, there's been a bunch of videos posted about the reactions that Nikki's gotten live. And at, they were mixed tonight. Like when they, they introduced her, there were definitely yeah. booze when it's like, it, it has been mixed reactions. You know, John, there, there was a movie and, and it kind of ties into this match because Charlotte queen came out with the Thanos gear. I, I appreciated that. Uh, but there was a movie called Avengers or Captain America, civil war. And Peter Parker says to Tony Stark, when you have the power to stop bad things and then the bad things happen, the bad things happen because of you. And Rhea Ripley, the bad thing tonight happened because of you. You could have done something uh, like this. Again, all three talented women. Love them. The story, the story they've been telling with these women, John Pollock. I don't know how anybody could have gotten invested in it. Right. Like Nikki Cross, so Nikki Ash is supposed to be this great underdog. Looks like a joke after this, man. Like I had no sympathy. For Nikki Cross out here these past few months, you know, like like when when she got beat by Charlotte, I almost beat you. I could have beat you. Like, no, nah, come on, man, go 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 sit down. And again, no disrespect to Nikki Cross. Love the the white chocolate cheesecake of sports entertainment, but this character was not it. At least the WWE's version of this character. And so now we're stuck in a division where Charlotte's beaten Nikki multiple times. She's beaten Rhea multiple times. Oscar, she's beaten multiple times. Like, what are they doing with these women, man? Like, I feel like they've got all the talent in the world, but there's no sense of being able to tell a good story. And when that happens, it's not their fault. It's your fault. Creative team, it's your fault, Vince McMahon, for not doing right by these women. It depresses me that this was the best women's match on the show. Yeah. You know, my... 
One of my favorite teams was uh, the 98 Utah Jazz, who were almost NBA <laughs> champions. I really got into them because they were all their second place. <laughs> Uh, so Charlotte wins. That was about it. I, I can't even tell you what the story was going into this. All I can tell you is that everyone got pinned by everybody. And they just, this was like insanity of the amount of matches between these three uh, that was going on. And with Becky now on SmackDown, mm. I think we're going to get a lot of this kind of mix until the draft. And hopefully they can mix things up because the women's division, it's it's largely these three on Raw. And I just think we're going to see more um, iterations of this unless they unless they swap some people and get some, some new blood in this women's division on the raw side. So I guess tonight guys, we did, we buried the lead that we got the brand to brand invitational with Becky challenging the SmackDown champion. We didn't even, uh, we didn't even touch on that part A raw talent. I guess, I guess once you're gone for a year, then you can be an official free agent and then go to whichever brand you feel like edge versus Seth Rollins edge came out to the brood theme then stopped midway down the aisle and his regular music played. Um, it was cool to hear the theme. And they seem to be almost like marketing the brood now, like with merchandise and different ideas. Yeah. So Edge going to a dark place here as he uh, conjured up the brood. Um, I, I don't, I, I thought like this was uh, a really strong match between these two. This was like, to me, the first match on the show that felt like a big pay-per-view level match involving these two. They got about 21 minutes here. Uh, it was a lot of selling by edge early on. And man, the way Michael Cole was just hitting all the hits because edge was bringing out all of his moves. Yes. This guy, mm -hmm. great performer, terrible name. Okay. He said it himself. If he could go back, he would have given himself a name that was more chantable that had multiple, like just was something that had multiple syllables to it. And with the names that like, this guy's gone all in on the edge isms like we got the educator the edgeomatic like yes. these are just these are terrible names but god bless the man that has just ridden this edge name for uh two, 25 years i mean he's been he's been able to, to work it in here but uh, i i thought they structured a really nice match here built around the neck of edge that rollins was constantly going for the stomp edge hit a glam slam as a uh, tribute to beth phoenix uh, that was noted uh, unfortunately, the other Phoenix reference we did not get when Seth hit a Phoenix splash and Pat McAfee called it a corkscrew moonsault repeatedly. So uh, we had multiple Phoenix uh, representation here. Edge went for a spear that Rollins countered with a pedigree, getting a near fall off of that. And the big one was after missing the Phoenix splash, Edge spears Rollins and Rollins kicked out and the place went nuts for that kick out. I think everyone bought it on that. Rollins then struck the neck. And Edge catches the boot on the stomp attempt, locks on the educator. Rollins breaks out of that. He goes to a cross face, then bashes Rollins head into the mat before locking on a sleeper hold and submitting Rollins in 21 minutes and 15 seconds. I would say this, this match had as high expectations as anything on this card. Kate, you said you were really looking forward to this one. Did it deliver for you? Kate, the uh, how did this match oh, did it deliver? Okay, for you? there we they go. Yeah, reach the expectation yes. level. Yes, yes, this was my favorite match of the night um, by some stretch. To I kind of expected that it would be. Um, just uh, I, I find Rollins delivers in big situations to like ninety percent of the time. Uh, I thought that this was like again maybe start off a bit slowly, but they built it up really well. They told her, they told a really good story. They, uh, the, this sort of history with the, 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 the neck and edges injuries, all was coming into play. I really liked the, the spot uh, of the, the spear into the pedigree. I thought that that was like, that was really unexpected. It's like, Oh, wow, I've never, I haven't seen that before. And, and I enjoy it when I get that, uh, when I get Get that feeling watching something. So yeah, I re I really liked this match. I thought it was almost like everything the rest of the show wasn't. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was really like well put together, and yeah, just like I said, very very well paced. Told a great story. Yeah, I th this was my match of the show, Nate. Mm -hmm. uh, be curious what you thought, and I, I thought I thought Seth was terrific in this match. Yeah, this match brought me back into the show because like for forty five minutes to an hour, I was done. I was checked out. After that Bianca match, and all of a sudden, John Pollock. Doom, 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 doom. I was like, 
Okay, okay. Like, you know how to get me back. Like, WWE is the ultimate abusive spouse, man. They know. Y'all, you done beat me up for a whole hour, and you brought me some chocolates and some wine, and I'm like, I can't quit you, Vince McMahon. And and so, like, the, the, the theme brought me back into it. But then, like Kate was saying, John, when they had the actual match, I'm like, yeah, like, this is this is a really, really good use of Edge at this point in his career. Seth usually delivers in these big-time matches, and I wish more of the show was like this. Unfortunately, it wasn't. But I, I would say this and a match that we're going to talk about here in a little bit were probably, you know, the highlights of the show for me. I was only surprised in the sense that, like, they've, they've been dangling Seth going for for the title, mm-hmm. even though you do have, like, the two heels in that scenario. Uh, I just don't see them going back to Roman and Edge. But nonetheless, um, that doesn't stop them either, that they could very well just go in a completely different direction after this. And it looks like they will have plenty of options with, with uh, Roman Reigns coming out of this. Uh, then we went into a, a slew of announcements here. So next year, Money in the Bank will be at Allegiant Stadium here in Las Vegas in uh, over 4th of July weekend. So I'm guessing it's going to be the Saturday uh, because Nick Khan talked about this week that in Las Vegas, when it comes to running an event, Las Vegas is a Friday or Saturday night town. That's why they chose Saturday. So I'm imagining they're going to do the same next year, which is very interesting, uh, Kate, to put money in the bank and seeing that show um, having the appeal to run a stadium for. I think it really speaks a lot that they're doing money in the bank and not SummerSlam at uh, Allegiant Stadium next year. I I think it's the right call, though. I think that Money in the Bank is just because it has this sort of place on that uh, and uh, it it is exciting and it's going to be like you have your title matches, but you also have these sort of marquee matches, the two the two ladder matches. Um, Yeah, I to me, it's uh, it, it, it it's one of the pay-per-views that should be elevated more than it actually is. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting experiment to take that show. Um then Mike Rome announced tonight's attendance, 51,326. I think that had a healthy amount of inflation to it, but uh, so is WWE for entertainment purposes only, their attendance listings. Okay, I only have so much uh, so much life in me. I don't want to spend too much of it on the Miz and Morrison segment with Xavier Woods. This was a pure ad, and their goal is for us to recap a paid advertisement for water. I'm not going to do it. Xavier Woods has a uh, new day as a new Wolfpack shirt. That's what we can mention. Uh, Bobby Lashley versus Bill Goldberg for the WWE championship. Uh, an interesting match for Goldberg here. So early on, Goldberg is just shoulder tackling this dude. Lashley then takes control. teases a jackhammer that gets stopped. We fast forward to Goldberg who gets into the ring and MVP takes his cane and goes to strike Goldberg in the knee. And I tried to watch this multiple times. <laughs> it did not look like this cane came anywhere close to Goldberg's knee. It, was a, it wasn't a great angle to watch it from, but this thing did not look smooth. But dude, Goldberg has never sold a body part in his life like this knee. <laughs> this man mentally detached his ACL for this angle. And he's limping around. He fought off the hurt lock. Lashley is just attacking the knee, drills Goldberg into the post multiple times, and Goldberg can't stand. The referee waves off the match, and it's over at 7 minutes and 11 seconds. Nate, after 7-11, did this deliver? Man, like, I think everybody took a big gulp after this match of whatever adult beverage they were drinking because... Like, I, I obviously being a WCW fan from the way back, like Goldberg, anytime Goldberg shows up, whether the story dictates it or not, I, I give him some benefit of the doubt. But this this match wasn't it, John. Like there was a point, I think, like Lashley went to the top and Goldberg slammed him. I thought like Lashley landed on his neck, man. I was oh, like, dude, the throw mm-hmm. was like, mm-hmm. dude, oh, my God, Lashley, Lashley rolled at the last possible second. It was. uh Yeah, mm-hmm. that was a scary looking uh, spot. Yeah, they I, each I, had a neck spot here. Yes. Yeah, I, I, it was a, it was not a ballet, but I, I think like the other thing is the ending le- left me flat, John. Like why, 
why do that? Like, I was expecting, like, okay, maybe, maybe this is a spot for Big E. Because, you know, obviously Big E has that affinity for Goldberg and big meaty men slapping meat. So maybe he comes out to save old Bill here. Nope. We just get <laughs> child abuse. <laughs> we just get <laughs> Lashley beating up somebody's kid. Yeah. Like, I just don't think, like, Nate, you're a perfect example. I just think the audience that's tuning in for Goldberg, they do not want to see Bill Goldberg immobile no. and not able to continue. Like Bill Goldberg is this mythical monster that is now 54 years of age. And I guess they feel that because of his price tag, he's got to be in these big featured matches. But to me with Goldberg, it's find your heel of the month and Goldberg comes in mm -hmm. and he murders a dude in two minutes. And that's what people want. Corbin comes out. Corbin tries to get a cut of his contract. Goldberg finds out about this. Corbin looks at Gage sideways. Goldberg murders this guy. That's yep. that's Goldberg. That's the value of him murdering people in two minutes. And I think in this one, they didn't want to pin Goldberg. So they came up with, with this scenario. And I just think people don't want to see Bill Goldberg sell. They don't want to see him vulnerable. They want to see Bill Goldberg of 1998 and be nostalgic. And I think that's... And when you're doing two matches a year, like it does wear thin with people. And I mean, he stated he has two more matches on his deal, but after this, um, Lashley continues the attack and it's gauge that jumps onto Lashley's back. It's thrown off. MVP pleads that Lashley had no idea that that was Goldberg's son and announces Lashley as the winner. And Goldberg is with gauge and yells, I'm going to kill you. So not only are they teasing a rematch, with Goldberg and Lashley, they are teasing a first time ever match between Goldberg Jr. And La at, at minimum, Nate, I think we're going to get a tag match here. Like Gage is full on. He is going to do a match. Yeah. No, nobody wants this, man. Like I know going back to AW, like some people really have this love affair with Hook, Taz's kid. I, I don't like Hook. Like, not the person, like the wrestling character. So if I don't like Hook, why do I like... Like, I care even less about Bill Goldberg's son in this wrestling storyline. And so, like, it again, like, the, the, the move to me, and maybe I'm wrong, John, maybe I'm not seeing the bigger picture, is if you're going to do a situation where Goldberg doesn't get pinned and we do this beatdown angle, Big E is the guy that saves Goldberg, setting up a match between actual wrestlers. Hey, what did you think about this whole uh, handling of, uh, of Goldberg and, and what comes out of this as well on the raw side? Because it's uh, not like they have baby faces built up for Lashley. I, I, I don't know where they're going with this. I don't want to see Goldberg versus Lashley again. Um, I, but I guess we will. I don't want to see a, a, a a 15 year old fighting Bobby Lashley. Uh, I don't know. Really get, I, I, I want none of this. I wanted, I didn't particularly want this match going in. It was, I think you said it was like seven minutes. And it, mm. to me, it was about three times longer than it needed to be. Um, this is like, like you said, I want, like, if you want a Goldberg match, what he did, uh, uh, I, a year to ago with Dolph Ziggler was yes. fine. Just give me that. Have him show up, kill someone, leave. It's fun. We're all kind of in on the joke now that he's not actually like a professional wrestler in the way that, that a lot of the other guys are. He can do these sustained matches and, and he shouldn't be in for God's sake. He's in his mid fifties. You don't have to, he, you don't have to pretend he's something he's not. He was never that thing, but for sure he's not that thing now. <laughs> Like, just, just make it stop. <laughs> yeah, it will be interesting because, I mean, he had he's outlined before that it's like it's two matches per year, which for this year is up with the Drew match on top of that. I'd be curious mm -hmm. if, like, they try to somehow work him onto that Saudi Arabia card because that was kind of like the Goldberg novelty was working those Saudi Arabia shows now that they are going back. And this, this totally felt like an angle to set something up in the immediate future as opposed to waiting till next year. And I'm sure that the, the the Saudis were so happy with that Goldberg Undertaker match they got. <laughs> well, <laughs> in fairness, really that really that's the match that should have had that match should have had a referee stoppage in it. That one should not have gone <laughs> on. So maybe they learned from their mistakes and applied it to this one. 
Uh, so there you go. That was uh, very many questions on the raw side uh, with the title picture and what comes out of this. But it is now time for the main event, very deep into the show. This is when you're making a choice between Manny Pacquiao and John Cena. And John Cena came out and he has adopted Super Mario 3 for his latest merchandise line. And they were pushing very hard, going for 17 championships. And would he beat Ric Flair's fake record that he actually has many more of? But Reigns is out. This match, I think when they're doing the introductions, like it did have a real big time feel attached to it. Like the crowd, like this felt like a main event throughout the whole summer. Like this was the clear cut main event of the show. The beginning of this uh, was Roman Reigns dominating Cena and to Cena selling, selling, selling. And he starts to try and fight back, goes for the five knuckle shuffle. Boom. He gets caught in the guillotine and Reigns is going to town with Superman punches Cena does not let people down. He does hit the five knuckle shuffle. And then it's near fall city. He hits an AA. He puts Reigns through the table on the floor with an AA. Reigns keeps kicking out. Uh, And then, dude, Cena did a lot more in this match than I was expecting him to. Mainly coming off the top. He took the sit-out powerbomb coming off the top. Uh, Reigns missed a spear going into the post. This post took a beating tonight from people and their shoulders. Reigns, uh, Cena hoists up Reigns onto his shoulders for a super AA and a super near fall. I mean, Michael Cole at one point, literally the words out of his mouth were appreciate this, cherish this (laughs) match, cherish it. Cena then, uh, God bless the man. He is going to the right industry because he was able to get this line out with a straight face. He yelled to Roman Reigns. Your time is up. My time is now. And roared like Roman Reigns. I was howling here in my office by myself at this spot. Like it was just unbelievable. This is like a child in a man's body. Reigns drops him with Superman punches. And then out of nowhere, Reigns hits the, the big spear. Clean win. One, two, three. I was hoping Reigns was going to hold up the one, two, three for John it was Cena. Right there. It I was thought right the whole there. match was structured for Reigns to get that moment with the one, two, three. He wins it in 23 minutes, and Reigns is standing tall. Before we get to the angle afterwards, let's uh, just get your analysis of the match, starting with you, Kate. What did you think in terms of uh, the main event and what we got out of Cena in 2021 going 23 minutes? I think Cena has been great. I I think that I've really the promo work that he just made absolutely charisma just you know very much just it, it just radiates from the man. I think it's been a, a very good move for them to to have him back and to to keep him engaged for as long as they have. Uh, I think that if there was one iota of doubt in anyone's mind that that Roman Reigns was winning tonight it's because John Cena just did has done such a good job creating his own narrative as to why he could win now as it happens with the stupid stipulation that they added last night they killed that off so there's absolutely no chance uh, you know if if the idea is Reigns is going to leave WWE we're like oh well okay you know maybe for half a second I thought that Cena might have won this but no that that killed it um Cena and Reigns, uh, you know, you know, going in, what kind of uh, match they're going to have? It's not necessarily the sort of slower power move for power move kind of thing. Not really my favorite. Like I much prefer what we got from uh, Rollins and Edge. Like that's more my my personal preference. But for what it was, I thought they did a good job. I thought the AA off the uh, off the the turnbuckle looked great. I thought that it it did. It was very slow at the beginning, but it did build. And clearly, the audience was getting engaged. They bought on a few of the near falls, so that's good. It it accomplished what it needed to. I think it was a weird choice just to have Roman win with a spear. Um, I mean, he hasn't even been using that as his finishing move for months. It's always been the guillotine. So I, I don't know, but yeah, obviously, right move to right move to bake, clean win. We we move on. Yeah, I mean, it was a pretty you know dominant ending, Nate. And 
On top yeah. of that, it's like the stipulation added on SmackDown for the life of me, I did not understand. <laughs> and wasn't even really like they mentioned it tonight in commentary, but it was yeah. to me almost to the detriment of the match because it was, I don't know, it added nothing. And it wasn't even like a focal point. I just, I thought it was an odd choice. But what did you think about the match, Nate? Yeah, I, th- I thought it was a good match. Second best match on the on the card, in my opinion. And, you know, the old saying, John, you, you either die a hero or you live long enough to become the villain. Well, in this case, Cena started as a hero, lived long enough to become the villain, but then lived even longer to become a hero again. Because <laughs> I think a lot of people's attitudes have changed on this man, John Peacemaker Toretto Cena. Like, this, this dude is good, man. Like, I knew, like, you know, yes, he hasn't been an active competitor for a while, but Big Match Johnny is not out here to disappoint people. He's not out here to disappoint the kid, John. He's here to have a good, decent match and sell some T-shirts that may or may not violate copyright laws. And <laughs> that's, that's what John Cena did, man. Like, never for a second, like, Kate, did I think that Roman was going to lose. So the question is, What's the story of the match? And I think the match told a good enough story. Uh, you know, it it felt like a big time SummerSlam match, which a lot of matches on this card didn't. And then we, you know, we get Roman the strong win, and then we set up something even bigger, perhaps with 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 uh, what happens after the match. So I, I thought, as far as main events go, was this some type of five star classic? No, but it did what it needed to do. Are you going to cherish this match? Maybe Cherish is a bit strong, John, but I'll I'll look back fondly in about five or six years like, oh, yeah, I remember Cena Reigns. That was nice. And move on with my day. This has only been it's been a month of Cena back for the company. Mm -hmm. To me, he has been the MVP. I'm not even going to say of the summer. I think of the year for for WWE. I mean, he came back. He has made such an impact Mm -hmm. on ticket sales. This is a guy that I mean, has just added a lot of life to the program. I mean, the amount of top guys that are just going to come back, do a program like this, lose clean as a sheet to your your top guy. I mean, I don't think you could ask anything more of what you got out of Cena, who by no means needs to be doing this at, at this point. Um, doing a lot more physically in this match than I think a lot of people would assume for a guy that's about to go do his latest movie project on top of that. So I think the guy uh, should be receiving all the accolades for doing the, doing this comeback, spending his summer here and making a, an impact on their whole live event business. But there was more to be had because as Reigns is standing tall over John Cena, Brock Lesnar's music hits and this crowd goes insane And out comes Brock Lesnar, who was accompanied by, dude, this guy had his own area code, okay? He looked like a monster walking out. What this man has been doing for the last year and a half on his farm, I mean, he has just been, he looks the biggest I've ever seen, Brock Lesnar. He's got the the hair. I mean, this is... This is a guy that has been. Uh, yeah. Yes, John Pollock, talk about the hair. Like, let's talk about this this facial hair. Plus, I did, am I am I am I was I drunk, John, or did does Brock Lesnar have a ponytail now? Like, was that something I actually saw, or was my eyes deceiving me, sir? Oh, this he's got the full Wardlow. Yes, the Wardlow. <laughs> there you go. So he comes out, big stare down with Roman Reigns, and then Roman exits the ring. Mm-hmm. My line of the night goes to Michael Cole once again, who reminds everybody, (laughs) Paul Heyman used to be the advocate for Brock Lesnar. It's like, you know what? That makes a lot of sense. Brock and Heyman used to be a team. That's right, Michael. Thank you. Thank you for putting all of that together for us. Thank (laughs) you for connecting the dots in such a way. Um, There's no possible way Michael Cole could have been your voice to lead that CM Punk promotion for the United Center. There's no way they could have been that subtle. Oh my God, can you imagine? No. Oh my God. Oh, wow. So um, anyway, the show ends and it's just Brock in the ring. And then you can see video afterwards, after they go off the air, dude, Brock Lesnar murders John Cena, the ultimate company guy. He just gets wow. suplexed <laughs> and destroyed by Brock Lesnar for the crowd there in Las Vegas. So, I mean, the MVP of the show is John Cena, but Lesnar's back. And my question to you, Kate, is when 
you do Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar because I don't think it's going to be at Extreme Rules next month. I somehow think not. Um, truthfully, um, uh, I actually feel a bit nauseous. I think it gets overlooked a lot that Brock, Brock Lesnar was named in the speaking out allegations. He's never said that the allegations he exposed himself to a female co-worker and uh, spoke to her in a, in a, a extremely demeaning way he's never denied that um and this is something that came up before it came up again last year uh i think that seeing him back i sort of figured that this is where we were headed um so yeah you know it uh i think it's a a fitting uh a fitting monument to the attitude that this company took to that entire uh, series of uh, series of incidents last year that he's back and that he is treated as a conquering hero. That's all I have to say on that. No, it's a completely uh, valid point that that should be brought up. Absolutely. Nate, yeah. any, any closing thoughts just on how the show went off the air? Yeah. Well, first of all, yeah, that, that was a, a great point uh, made by Kate, something that, slipped under my radar, uh, you know, because I, I was just sitting here mad at Brock for what he did to Kofi. Like, so that's why I don't like that guy. But, <laughs> I'm but now, still not over that. But like, you know, <laughs> yeah. He also, I mean, he 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 also unapologetically, unapologetically went, like, this is going a few years back, but it like, went on a, a a homophobic screed that was that was so vile that the mm. reporter from ESPN who heard it, like, refused to reprint what he said because he thought it was that bad. <laughs> This is our baby face, kids. See it, see it, Survivor Series. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, but I guess overall, John, the show, the show had the potential to be a really, really fun night. You know, kind of continuing this love fest for wrestling that started on Friday. And unfortunately, it didn't, man. Like, I'm hoping tomorrow with NXT can kind of pick up the pieces. But, like, everything following Bianca up to the Seth match, like, it was just a real downer for me. I don't know how it came across in the building, in the stadium, but like this show could have been so much more, and it felt like a diminished version of SummerSlam, which is a shame because SummerSlam's always been one of my favorite WWF, WWE shows, and this this just wasn't it, John. Like if if I didn't know I had to talk to you and Kate tonight and wasn't looking forward to that, I w- I would have been in bed or drunk by now because I don't have time <laughs> for, the, for the show Vince McMahon gave us tonight, John Pollock. No, that's uh, that's a perfect summary of the (laughs) Nate Milton viewing experience tonight. Uh, This was far from a great show. I think the highest I can go is thumbs in the middle. Uh, My match of the show, as I mentioned, it was Edge and Rollins. Uh, I I thought the main event, it was I think if you went into this looking forward to this match, I think it delivered in that sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, And outside of those two matches, it's like I think you're going to like like pre Seamus wasn't bad, but that's that's about it. Pre Seamus, like the raw women's match. Yeah, I mean, they were, they were fine. Like there was, there was fine stuff on the show. There was also a lot of stuff that was extremely rushed. I think mm. a lot of people were left with um, disappointment over the whole handling of Bianca Belair and Sasha Banks. And, and this was also, a, it was a very long show. And I think that that yeah. was, you know, that had become, you know, a hallmark uh, pre pandemic for this company of these marathon shows that just war on people. And I thought tonight was kind of evidence of that, of booking way too many matches on this show. Mm-hmm. And instead of just having a concise, solid card of say seven matches that had dedicated stories to them that could have their time allotment, shoot some angles and keep it to, you know, a you know, three and a half hour show, I think is more than satisfactory for, for people that like that is, yeah. For a SummerSlam, like a perfectly fine length. So there you go. Those are our thoughts uh, out for SummerSlam. So we will take some phone calls uh, before we wrap up here. So if you want to get in and share your thoughts, uh, raise your hand. And I'm going to try not to screw this up. So we will see uh, how this goes. This is definitely new territory for me. I see that we have Hanzi on the line. So let's go to Hanzi first uh, to give his thoughts on SummerSlam. Hanzi, are you there? Yo, what's going on, man? Uh, I, first of all, I love the new trio, man. This is like a one-night trio. Like, you know what I mean? It's pretty cool. John and Kate plus Nate. This is awesome, man. Uh, you, guys, you guys all did a good job. Um, 
I again, I, I ain't in the pay per view was that good. Uh, I think a lot. I, I share the same sentiment that some of the things killed my mood. I got to give WWE props though. I mean, they found a way to distract us from not caring about a Saudi Arabia promotional uh, commercial because they had that Bianca <laughs> thing happen, whatever. Right? So I, I, I got to give Vince McMahon credit for at least like pulling the smooth moves like that. Um, I, again, I don't. I'm looking forward more to the discourse about it. Like, there's people online that are like, well, if you if you're mad about Becky returning and winning the championship, you should blame CM Punk because they made it. WWE was made to do this. Like, I was like, what? What are you guys talking about? This is the stupidest move ever. I think um, my match of the night was probably- not competition. <laughs> exactly, man. C- CM Punk's broken everyone's brain within 24 hours. Um. I thought Seth, Seth and Edge were probably the match of the night, and Cena and Reigns were probably the second. Um, I, I thought, for the most part, uh, I, the Lashley and uh, I, I like the Lashley beatdown, but I'm not looking for. I guess that's going to be the Saudi Arabia uh, main event, probably. But other than that, I just thought the show was kind of uh, it, it was fun online, but it just it wasn't uh, it wasn't a good watch. So uh, that's basically it. But uh, guys, thank you. And, and by the way, John, before I go. Um, I forgot to ask because you didn't cover news, but what were your thoughts, especially now after SummerSlam, about what Roman Reigns said with Ariel Hawani? And I'll leave you guys with that. I'll get all your guys' thoughts on that if that's cool. Peace. Um, we did a very long interview. I imagine he's talking about the uh, the CM Punk comments, uh, which if you didn't hear the interview, his, his comments were that uh, some of the complaints made by people like Punk about part-timers coming back were made by people that were bitter and weren't as as over as they think they were. And his comment specifically was that CM Punk did not move the needle to the level that the rock did, which, I mean, you can, you can make that argument. Yeah. I don't, I think it's been somewhat mischaracterized that he was saying CM Punk didn't move the needle period. He was making a comparison to the rock, but nonetheless, it was a shot at CM Punk, which I, especially this week, I don't think you're going to be too surprised by, but I would say of, of all weeks, this would not have been the best one to be targeting punk to uh, in terms of his star power. No, it's yeah, you're, you're really coming around for the cell phone in that one. Like yep. he, he had to know that was going to come smack him in the face right away. Well, that's the thing, especially when, like when you know the show you got, John Pollock, it's, <laughs> it's, it's like if we play an Uno, John Pollock, and I'm sitting here with a with a handful of Bluetooths, and you got draw fours, reverses, skips, and wilds, and I'm making fun of you for playing Uno. Eventually, that's going to come back to bite me because you hold all the cards, John Pollock. Exactly the analogy I was going to go for <laughs> as well. Uh, let's continue on here, and we're going to go to uh, Nick. What's going on, guys? Nick, your thoughts on SummerSlam? Oh, Nick, with the like, the, I love the hair, Nick. Oh, awesome. thank you, I appreciate it. It does not look like this it's anymore. Very sadly, photo. <laughs> yeah, this is a still photo. We don't know what the present day Nick is uh, sporting right now. Um, but yeah, I'll peel back the curtain a little bit. I have to get on a plane in like four hours, so I stayed up to watch the show, and I'm just gonna head to the airport after this. And I thought, you know what? I'm gonna watch SummerSlam. I'm gonna go to the airport happy. Alas, uh, forget SummerSlam. I am sadness slam because this show uh, really bummed me out at points as you guys were talking about. I, I think you guys articulated my thoughts on the whole Becky Bianca uh, debacle, I think is the only way to put it perfectly. And I really understood what this was all about when they aired that crown jewel promo in the middle of this show and subsequently watched the Goldberg angle and also Brock coming out as well. And it's sad that like we're in you know, the period of WWE history where like one of their tentpole pay-per-views is essentially, you know, an advertisement or a buildup for, you know, a show in Saudi Arabia, which, you know, I think the public perception Mm -hmm. of that event is in the toilet as it is. So, I mean, it's really, it was a disappointing show all around. I really enjoyed Edge and Rollins and I really enjoyed uh, John Cena working as the underdog, which I think it's rare that we get to see him in that role and it really works. But, I won't be revisiting those matches because I think when a show is like this cataclysmically awful to watch at points, you know, it drags the rest of the good content down as well. So, I mean, I, I usually like to come on here and be positive, but it was, it was sort of hard to be positive as you guys were talking about. So yeah, those are my thoughts. Well, I I hope the show didn't break you, Nick. And I hope uh, wherever your destination is, you have a safe flight. Thank you. I'm going to Nashville. So maybe I'll catch some impact while I'm there. Who knows? Okay. Well, have a great time in Nashville. Thank you. Appreciate it. Awesome. 
of all the cities out there uh, to get over uh, a rough pay-per-view, Nashville would be high up on the list, I would think. Yes. I mean, it, look, anytime you can get some some whiskey and hear a, hear a good tune, John, head over to Music City, it's got to be. It's got to be a good time. All right. Uh, we're going to go now to uh, quickly becoming a very popular caller. He is the voice of Rewind to Raw. He is Colby John. When SummerSlam ends is when we call in. It's August 21st with John Pollock, Kate McD and AB filling in for waiting, who be at a wedding that ended before the action in the ring. Becky's back. She got a fight. Won the belt in 26 seconds with Sasha nowhere in sight. Then Brock comes back, him and dies of fright. So ice cream bars for all. Let's take a bite. Well, but you could do this every oh. single show. It will not get old with you. I love these. these I, I feel so fortunate to be here for this. Ah. Well, it's a gimmick you guys. that works. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm going to ride that thing hard. Ah. Col- Colby, did you did you watch this with the, with the family? What was the, uh, oh, the my overall gosh. reaction to Super Slam tonight? Oh, my gosh. It's the first uh, pay-per-view I sat the entire family through from start to finish. And it was a long one. And the kids got real, real tired. I will tell you, John, you made a good point about Cena being MVP of the year. Because Cena's like the MVP of my family. Because, yeah. uh, you know, the kids that knew nothing about wrestling until we went to this live event a few years, a few, we, few weeks ago. And now, now, my, now my little boy is all about the guy wearing the green shirt. So when, when, when Cena oh, came out he comes today, out with a new shirt, and you got to buy him the new oh, one now, right? <laughs> well, oh, yeah. Man. yeah then, they, then they pushed the 16 title thing real, real hard tonight. Like, they just mentioned it last night. You know, about him winning this record. He comes out and there's no green shirt. And so my boy's confused. He kept thinking Drew McIntyre was Roman Reigns. <laughs> so he kept telling me how Roman, why does Roman Reigns have a sword trying to chop the guy's head off at the end? And I'm trying to tell him, oh, no, you don't want to do that to your little brother. And there was a lot of action there. Uh, it was real, real wild. Like I said, it was quite the one to sit through uh, with all the kids and stuff. But, uh, uh. The, the I, company I guess, that preaches uh, uh, smiles on faces has a <laughs> quite the message. Well, that, the guy's then, trying to then, behead someone with a sword. Well, that, and then you got you got angry Ashley, you know, angry Lashley, choking some boy out, and I got to try to tell my boy like, oh, that's not, you know, the, you know, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be proactive in the whole situation, and then MVP screaming on the mic to everyone that you know, oh, he didn't know it was a boy, and uh, anyway, it was. He really was, didn't. Like if someone just, I, I gotta think if someone's jumping on my back and like grabbing me like that, you know, I'm not going to be like, uh, can I see your ID please? Like I, I it, it did not strike me as unreasonable. That it was self, self-defense, violently. like no, no court of law. Yeah, with, with exactly. Fans jumping the rail. I mean, we, uh, exactly. that's, that's not to be encouraged. Yeah. So, you know what, Gage, you stepped into the line of fire. I think Bobby Lashley, well within his rights, doesn't know who's on his back, might have a weapon on him. Who knows? Yeah, you really don't know. And then uh, and then I was really wondering, could, you know, could, could Becky's little heel tactics mean that she's leaning towards, uh, you know, some sort of alliance with Seth? That would be such a brutal idea. If you're bringing back Becky as a heel, it's like, man, you've, mm. you've lost the plot at that point. Yeah, good point. And does this also mean that, that, that Becky and that worked out so well the first time they tried it? Yeah. What was that last one, Colby? Uh, well, does this also mean that, that Becky and Brock are on SmackDown now? Well, presumably. Yeah. I mean, unless, like, unless they're needed on raw. I mean, I think this is a, this is a very fluid situation, Colby. So I think okay. we can, we can leave with that assumption. Um, okay. Praise be. All right. Thank <laughs> you, Colby. All right, guys. See ya. All right. I love his calls. Those are always uh, tremendous. All right. We're going to go to Australia. Rory, Rory, what time is it there? Uh, well, it's a very tough call to follow, and it's three fifty-two p.m. in the afternoon here on su- on Sunday, so not too bad. Um, but uh, yeah, this this show was was something else, uh, that's for sure. Um, for me, I'm at a point where I'm not expecting anything high uh, high quality from WWE now, like with with Brock Lesnar coming back. Like uh, I think that's. That's to be expected. I can see Vince shelling out a bit of money for for him as a response to Punk. Um, uh, me, me personally, like I was excited to see Lesnar because whenever he's back, he's actually kind of entertaining in in his role and what he does. Um, I 
how do you stuff up the biggest comeback that has been teased for a year, pretty much, in Becky Lynch? I uh, I don't know why. Like, if, if they knew they were going to go long a little bit, why not give them 20? Why not give them 15? Give them some. Like, you don't, you don't do the squash thing. I don't know. I don't know the thinking behind that. I, there's probably no thinking, to be honest. Um, but, yeah, as a whole, this whole show was just, uh, like, like it was great to see so many people there. Like, it was great to see that spectacle. It was great to see that image and everything like that. But, um, yeah, uh, I, uh, and it's not just the fact that Punk came back on, on Rampage. If, the, if that didn't happen... This show would still feel flat. This show would still feel like a nothing show, uh, to be honest with you. And uh, I, I'm I'm a guy who's trying to look for positives in, in WWE right now, um, which is very very difficult, to be honest with you. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm just I'm ba- I'm baffled uh, by some of the decisions. Uh, the 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 crown jewel thing, like out of all the times to be going over to the, the Middle East, now is probably not the best time in the world in, in, in the world to uh, to be going into that area. Um, I'm just thinking of safety and certain certain things that are going down. Um, but yeah, I I don't know. I, I don't Kate going forward, please don't expect too much from this company. Just don't. Just don't put your don't put your don't put your sights high on 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 what what, what goes on here because it ain't going to be that way for a long long time. So yeah, I'll just leave you on that one there. Thank you, Roy. Thanks for the call. <laughs> Set your expectations low. Those are his uh, words of wisdom. Um, our final call of the night. We are going to be bringing in the co-host of the NWA podcast, Chris from LA. Hey, what's up, John? What's up, Kate? What's up, Nate? Um, yeah, what's, what's up? <laughs> the floor is yours. Uh, Bianca Belair, proceed. Oh, Jesus Christ, man. Um, Debbie, like, I, I was like, yesterday after watching AEW, I was like on this like wrestling euphoria that took me all the way to the next morning. That took me through the afternoon um, that would have still been here if I didn't turn on SummerSlam. Um, I'm in like two different chat groups with uh, Nate. uh, And um, I wasn't watching SummerSlam the whole night. Then the Bianca batch came on and they were like, oh, go ahead. And I was like, well, maybe I'll go ahead and watch this match. Um, And WWE is like the most dystopian bullshit on the planet man it's like it's like you watch that show to be disappointed you know what i'm saying (laughs) and i you know i'm a a big fan of like anthology anthology shows like tales from the dark side and twilight zone and shit like that but usually even if it's a show with a bad ending there's some kind of like lesson to be learned uh, <laughs> the lesson to be learned watching wwe is just you know life sucks and you know that's the end of the story uh, oh man this, uh, this is not moderna chris this is just uh <laughs> man this is like um <laughs> this is just chris like i'm just i'm done i have nothing left here to to show I'm, any there's no sunshine I'm loving the optimism in that in a uh, and that sort of uh, as you were building up to it and just to have it go off the cliff right at the end it's like yeah so <laughs> at the end everything sucks we all die nothing matters <laughs> yeah, I, i'll That's save turn <laughs> yeah i'll save my um hot racial takes for um i'll get into um cultural biases and eurocentrism and all that stuff um, when me and Nate do our show this week, but yeah, man. Yeah, if, if nothing else, Chris, if nothing I'm, I'm else, like Vince, Vince set us that. up. Vince set us up for maybe our most controversial episode of the Nubian Wrestling Advocates ever, because it's it, it might just be one topic. Bianca right, Belair, yeah. what the hell happened? Dot dot dot. We we'll talk and about like, that for the next ninety minutes. With, with the the problem that I have with it is like they don't have any like 
like cultural, um, like someone to give advice, you know, like an advisor or something to just be like, just think about how that looks. You guys have been promoting these black women on your show for the greater part of the year. You went out of your way to say on your television, this is the first time two black women have main evented a WrestleMania. Um, you, they leaned into making the Sasha Banks, Bianca Belair match, mm-hmm. the favorite to win the ESPY. And then it's like, when we have mm-hmm. the white people that we want to really win, mm-hmm. uh, it's just, I don't fucking know, man. God damn. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 but the, like, this why is it bad at this point, you know? Well, I, I think to me too, it's like with, with Bianca, you have like, this company has a history of failures with African-Americans and they have right. a history of failures with women. So now it's like you've got the intersectional mm-hmm. failure thing happening. So this yeah. is not a good look. It is. It's, it's intersectionality. It's definitely intersectional. It's like the one thing, the da- Daniel Bryan thing, that sucks too, but there's no like racial component to it you know or there's no like um it it doesn't have these this extra cultural baggage that also yeah yeah it's like you're not letting down a culture full of people you're not like there's not like you know you basically have sold this woman on um being like the black wrestling heroine um to to for months just to do this kind of fuckery Hmm. Um, and I just, I just want it to make sense. Um, actually, I don't want it to make sense. I don't care anymore. Uh, but um, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it just is what it is, man. It, they, they do have a problem in that company um, with, without thinking these things through. And I mm-hmm. just really wish that would stop. I mean, I, I, I really wish somebody would just stop and say, hey, Vince or whoever's looking at this before we go down this exact path maybe we should think about how this looks um optically for our minority wrestling fans especially the young ones because they think about that when it comes to like your john cena's and you know other top baby faces in that company when it comes to the the black wrestlers um and other minorities too, they just don't, that component of thought isn't there. And that is a problem. Um, that, and, and, and that, that need, if you're going to think about that with, with John Cena, you don't turn this guy for Hill for years because you don't, you, you care about the make a wish kids and all this other stuff. But none of that shit matters when it comes to the black women wrestlers um, or, you know, the, the, the black minority talent, Kofi Kingston, whoever, um, this is uncult- um, unconscious bias. It's racist and it's a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's well. And if you like, if you if you look at something like they're, they're sort of, if you want to talk about with the women, these sort of four horsewomen that they push: Charlotte, Becky, Bailey, Sasha. Only one of the four does not have a win at WrestleMania. Only yeah. like. Only one of the four ha- still has to ha- still has not had that big that big moment. <laughs> um, only only one of the four has not does not have a record associated with her title runs. Mm. Other case, than case the number of times without successfully on defending. My fire, man. I was, I was <laughs> Sorry, I'm not. Okay, yes, <laughs> this is what I do. I make things worse. It's like <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't mind. I was already bad, but yeah, but I. This is yeah, the trailer I, for the next NWA podcast where you will get more with yes, Chris yes, exactly. and Nate. They're, uh, this is, this is going to be on the uh, the menu for the next show. Yes. And, and the thing is, John, like I, I think, you know, Bomani Jones, who is uh, a name that maybe some of the audience knows, uh, works at ESPN now, has a thing where he calls it Two America, where two groups can look at the same thing and come away with different readings of that situation. And I've already seen that tonight, John, with the way that this match was booked, where a lot of people and a lot of people that don't look like me, quite frankly, are saying, just give it time. Let's see how the story plays out. 
that this is just going to make Bianca a bigger star. And then there's a lot of people like me, John, who are like, we've been told this how many times? And how many times do you have to tell me something that is proven to be false in order for me to believe that it's not going to happen? And so I, I honestly, John, like I would love by the time that the, the next episode of NWA podcast comes out to be completely wrong about this. And they do find some way to make Bianca rebound from this and make her an even bigger star. But what what in the WWE's history, recent and historically, makes me believe that? You know, they, they've given me no evidence, John, to leap to that conclusion. So until they do, they've got to prove it to me. And, and I think that's where a lot of people, uh, you know, particularly black folks, brown folks, you know, maybe, you know, even people in like uh, the LGBTQ community, you know, female fans, like there's a lot of people who have mm-hmm. been underserved by their entertainment and things like tonight really kind of strike that nerve, John. And I think that's why you're kind of seeing the different reactions to that match tonight. Yeah. And I, and I think that especially because it is Bianca Belair that has been this, this crossover performer that has gone, it has been a representative for this company outside of just the television program. And I think you've seen that person have that ability to cross over and be this, this significant star for, for the company on top of it. And this is still like, I still feel Bianca Belair is in that development stage where I mean, prior to the Royal rumble, like this was, I mean, it was this rapid ascent mm-hmm. to, to this top position. Like it is still establishing her. So I think this is like a very important period for her still. And that's why this match, I think tonight was very important with Sasha Banks. So We're going to end it on that note. I want to thank all of the callers and everybody staying up incredibly late with us, except for Rory, who is uh, just chilling (laughs) at four in the afternoon. This has been tailor-made for his time zone. Uh, But Nate and Kate, I want to thank both of you uh, for for joining me, the inaugural edition of John and Kate plus Nate. Uh, And I want to thank all the people out there as well. Thank you so uh, much for having me. Oh, This has been great to have both of you on. Uh, and I want to thank all of the people tuning in, whether you are uh, new members of the Post Wrestling Cafe or old as well. We had a very big period overnight with uh, with all the punk news and stuff. So yeah. I want to just extend my thank you to everybody that's uh, checking this out, helping uh, support the site. And we will be back on Monday night. Wei Ting shall return. I think Wei Ting has been lurking all night long. Uh, but this has been a lot of fun to chat with both of you. I hope we get the chance to do this again. Why, why didn't Wei show up? Like. Future. Way, way ruined it. Like every the WWE taught us, John, if you've got a surprise, just show up and that'll make everything better. Way should have just ran in here in the last minute and it would have been great. And so he could have talked for 26 seconds and that would have been a wrap. So yeah, Wade, he could have taken Nate and I in 26 seconds. And that's yes. it. That's the whole show. Well, I was going to say if he raised his hand, I would have gone to shake it and he probably would have struck me and then I would have been gone in 26 seconds. So I didn't want to fall for that. Uh, so that's going to wrap it up, everyone. That's the SummerSlam post show. Uh, Kate, you can hear every month here on Rewind to Smackdown, which we are starting to have discussions about whether we rename the show or not. Like, mm. what is what is DA show on Friday nights? We shall find out. Uh, and of course, Nate, where can people follow all of your great work? Yes, this was uh, this was fun. You know, the show we talked about aside, it was great talking with you two. Like, you sold me on the name, John, John and Kate plus Nate, but the show exceeded my expectations. Uh, you can check me out on Twitter at in the number eight M O Z A I K at Nate Mosaic. As John mentioned a little while ago, the Nubian Wrestling Advocates is a part of Post Wrestling. Uh, myself, Chris from LA, and Andrew Thompson, the, the birthday boy this week. Uh, we do that show the second Sunday of every month. So I'm sure we've got so much to talk about uh, coming out of SummerSlam for the next episode. Uh, there's the Rocky Mind via Picture Show archive still up on post. Uh, Let's see. I've got the Kings of Sport. We've got a Patreon, patreon.com backslash Kings of Sport. Five bucks gets you in the door. If you want to pay more, we won't stop you. Uh, There's so much stuff, man. DC TV podcast, uh, the main event over at Place to Be Nation. Got a lot going on, John, but but I always got time for John Pollock. And and on a less on a less happy note, tomorrow night. It's nothing, nothing happy about what me and Eric Marcotte do. To Martin Bush being this so-called mystery partner at, at, at the NXT event. Up next, BDE. It's gonna be it's gonna be it's gonna be brutal. You know, last time I talked to Martin was on a charity podcast. Nothing charitable, John Pollock, about what <laughs> me, what me and Eric are gonna do to Martin Bushby tomorrow, four o'clock 
Y'all check it out. We defending the, the, the BDE tag team titles. And uh, hopefully that, that match goes more than 26 seconds, John. That is up next summer, 4 p.m. <laughs> Eastern time, twitch.tv slash up next podcast. And I understand Nate cut the second best promo of the weekend <laughs> uh, on the on the tailgate today. Uh, but final word goes to you, Kate. Where can people go if they want to hear you or read you rant about wrestling? They can, well, uh, I am I am a, a simple person with the uh, very, I, I, basically the place you can find me is on Twitter. I am She Rants About Wrestling or She Rants MTL, as in Montreal, Kate for Montreal. Um, and that's uh, that's sort of where I, I get most of this out of my system. I'm not nearly as productive as you gentlemen. <laughs> Uh, very productive tonight. All, all of it, both of you, uh, carrying me through this as I, uh, battled, uh, zoom technology tonight, but mm. everything seemed to, uh, work very well. So thanks to everybody for tuning in to the SummerSlam post show. And that is it for us. We will talk to you on Monday night after raw. <laughs>